I use a group me text that uh, sends out to my guys or my group of people that there is a burn on, I generally try to burn in the middle of the week, you know, between Monday and Friday. I do that for two reasons. One, especially in summer when I have a lot of smoke, I don't want to smoke out any of the neighbors around me and they're usually at work during that time of day. So it works out real well. I don't get a lot of looky-loos because everybody's at work, but also most of my guys are retired. So they don't really have anything to do during the middle of the week. They're usually playing with the grandkids on the weekend. So it works out and I can grab about 12 to 16 people on any given burn. So when they do show up and I hand out radios and all the drip torches, I, uh, I have a little whiteboard here that I've usually drawn this out the night before. And I've got a depiction of what that property looks like. Uh, now, if it's 40, 80, 100 acres, I can usually talk about it on the map and I can usually see all the guys that are on the fire, or all the gals that are on the fire. Uh, but what I've learned over time is, is if I start getting those bigger ones like 320s, 640s, I hand out maps from Google and then I mark on those maps and then each fire team will get one of those maps because sometimes your radios only last from four to six hours and we've been on fires before that lasted eight. Well, you're gonna outlast your battery on your, on your radio. So if they have a map, they know exactly where I'm at and I know exactly where they should be if I can't see them. So we talk about it here, we agree on it. Uh, and then from there, we start distributing equipment. With the equipment, <clears throat> I make sure that everybody that's running a UTV, because I've usually got two people on each cardinal direction of the fire, regardless of the acreage. So I've got two east, two west, two north, two south. They'll always have one of these between the pair. Typically, because I only have two of these kestrels, <clears throat> these are very important. They're almost like your phone. They're great because they, they, they give me everything but wind direction. They'll give me humidity, they'll give me dew point, and uh, what's the other thing they'll give me? Wind speed. Wind speed, that's what I was looking for. Okay, we use radios. Obviously we don't use this one anymore, but things do happen on fires every now and then. I kind of use this as a prop. The radio is probably the most important and the most expensive that we have in the, in the arsenal but obviously it's not more than expensive than your life. So, but this was one that happened probably about a month ago. Guy clipped it to his shirt, didn't have a radio harness on, knelt over to do something, it fell in the fire and he didn't know about it. So we had to go back and retrieve it. But we did find it, we did get a new one. Water is always important. Gloves are always usually important. We'll talk about clothing for just a minute. This is typically how I dress on a fire. Some type of high, high heel sneaker, or not high heel, but a high ankle sneaker, usually made of leather. I've just had these for a long time and they work well for me. But as of now, there's really no requirement, a clothing requirement that is provided by the state or dictated by the state to any of the PBAs. But what I try to tell my people is come, come prepared. You know, wear long pants, wear appropriate shoes, I'll provide the gloves. I got tons of different sizes of gloves, long sleeve and pants, usually fire retardant if you can get them. <clears throat> Bolt cutters, I try to make sure that every pair on the team has this. So those guys in those four cardinal directions between those UTVs, at least one of those UTVs has usually got one on it. What I try to do on day of fire, I get with the landowner and I tell them if they have any gates that are uh, sharing with their neighbor, go ahead and open those gates up and just leave them open provided there's no cattle or anything else in there that they're trying to contain. Because if I can keep from cutting somebody's fence and making double work for them later on down the road, that's what I try to do. Luckily, we've in six years that I've been doing this, we've never had to use these, but we keep them just in case. We've, we've got fencing pliers too, just in case. Uh, a rake. Not a lot of guys like to use these anymore. They're usually good on the fire line for stirring that stuff up and making bare ground on your pasture land. Uh, but usually if you've got a good fire break, what we try to do for fire breaks, it's usually landscape dependent and what it looks like with their neighbors. Uh, some we can get away with bare ground, some we can get away with mowed uh, uh, lines, some are just uh, water lines. 
but uh, if we can get down to bare ground, that's kind of what we prefer, especially the bigger ones, because you know when that fire hits that bare ground, that fire is not going any further than that. And it, once you start working on water lines and mode lines, it makes it a little more difficult on the group that you have there trying to control the fire. <clears throat> In the past, we've used flappers. Flappers are real good for knocking the oxygen out of those fires. It's just running it on the fire line and scooting it along. And it, I mean, <laughs> these shoes are so old and so burnt on the bottom because I've just kind of stomped fires out as I went. But we've kind of taken over with the uh, scoop shovel. It seems to work a little bit better. Obviously, it's wider and it's not as cumbersome to carry. And you can stick this. I usually stick this right behind the headache rack on my ATV or UTV. That way I have a shovel and then I have water. Our, we don't have any of ours here, but <clears throat> we do have three 65 gallon uh, mule sprayers and those are built in Tuttle, Oklahoma. We like to use local people. That way we're spending our money in the state. And if I have a problem or I have a piece of equipment that fails on me, they can either deliver it to me or I can scoop it up and take it to them. And it works out really good. This year, I think John and OPBA bought 11 of those and distributed those out to uh, most of the PBAs that were, that were active. So they work out really well. Uh, where else am I going? Drip torches. Drip torches, we like to use a 50-50 mix and that's usually diesel and gasoline. Now you can kind of play with that ratio. In the winter, I, do, I use the 50-50 mix. I try to keep it just straight 50-50 because your grass is dry enough that as soon as you lay a flame to it, it's gonna take off anyways, whether you want it to or not. In the summer, it's a little bit different. So I'll raise that to maybe 60-40 and I'll, I'll, I'll use a lot more gasoline. So I have that uh, accelerator hitting that a lot faster and a lot harder because you'll find out some of these summer burns burn really easy, but they burn really slow and they burn really low and they're a really boring fire, but they're super, super safe. And we're getting to where we like doing those a lot more than we like doing the dormant season burns. So if I can lean landowners towards that, that's what I try to do. But the drip torch is a very important tool. Most of our ATVs and sprayers now, we've kind of designed things where we can set this inside of its own cradle so it doesn't roll over and fall out and dump stuff all over the ground. You know, we've looked behind us before and one was dumping and fire was chasing us. So those, you learn as you go. You make mistakes as you go and that's how you figure out exactly what you need. As a landowner, when I come out and we do the, uh, we do the burn plan together, there's usually three or four things I talk to the landowner about. When we arrive, we'll need water and we'll probably need about two to three cases of water. Uh, we'll also need a lunch anything simple. I've had things from pizza to tacos to, you know, uh, grandma made sandwiches. We don't care. I mean, by the time you've been on fire for four or five hours, you're tired and you're hungry. All you, all you want to do is eat it. You don't care what it looks like or what it smells like. Uh, am I forgetting anything else that we usually ask for? Okay. Uh, motor oil is also good. I mean, if you're draining your, I drain my, uh, my skid steer about once every two months. When I drain that out, I'll filter it out and then I'll put that in a separate container and then I can use that in here with the 50-50 mix in the place of diesel. So it works just as well. Now you'll have to clean your filter out a little bit better the next time you use it, you know, before you set it over uh, to store it, you'll want to clean that out with a little bit of gasoline and then put it in there. Because if not, that diesel, that uh, oil will clump up on it. Make sure you screen your oil, use the oil before you put it in there or it'll clog up the, the vacuum filters. Okay. And then the last piece that we'll talk about, and then you guys are welcome. There's some items in there that we keep like extra items for the gator, extra items for the sprayers, extra sprayer nozzles, things like that. High fail equipment items that we know are gonna go down. And then the last thing we'll talk about before John takes over will be the backpack sprayer. This is a very nice to have piece of equipment. Uh, it's not so nice probably in the summer when it's 100 degrees, putting that thing on your back. It's not that heavy and cumbersome, but it does work well because it will push fire if you're in an area with uh, litter, leaf debris, things like that where you want, the, you want to redirect the fire somewhere to get it to go. Uh, and it also will put out fire. If you sweep it fast enough at a higher RPM, you can knock the fire down just like you would with water, thus conserving your water. You know, even though we have three tanks out there, if we can do that whole fire without dropping down one drop, I'm a pretty happy camper. 
uh, things that you have to remember in the summer. You're gonna have to worry more about your people in the summer than you will in the winter. In the winter, you kind of layer. By the time you get down to the end of the fire, you're about into this in the winter. In the summer, you can only shred so many clothes. I mean, it ain't naked and afraid out there. But uh, uh, the concern is I, I like to have more water and I like to have it on ice and some not on ice. Because in, in my group, I have a lot of retired people and uh, they're a little bit older than I am. I'm 50, I've got guys in their 80s. I've got a group, uh, a couple that's probably in their 90s. And all they do for me, they don't even touch the ground. All they do for me is provide my people water all day long and they'll run gas for me or run fuel for me or drip torch fuel or whatever. They're kind of my gophers, you know, and it works. Everybody plays their part. Every single person out there plays their right part. Now I get a lot of phone calls during this time of year. I got a lot of burn piles and I've been waiting until the winter to do that. Don't do that. Your burn piles go right now because the grass is green. There's tons of chlorophyll in there, which is moisture. So if you mow around those big uh, burn piles that you have, mow around them three or four times, you know, get that 18, 20 foot diameter around it and then light it up on the downward side, you know, just like you would start a regular grass fire. You know, things are different in the dormant season than they are in the winter. When the temperature is 40 degrees, I don't really have a lot to worry about with people. But when that temperature comes up to about 100 and 105, like it does in Oklahoma very often, uh, then I have to worry about the older people that I have. Even me, I mean, last year I got heat exhaustion where I had to lay down in the barn in the shade for about an hour just to get my wits about me because it just pushed too hard too fast, you know, but I know better. And then you guys are welcome to look at John's equipment. I'm not as detailed on John's equipment as John is. I know this is a 200 gallon uh, pump unit that they use. And that one, I think now that they, they've been using it for about three years, it's an 800 gallon. And it's, it also serves as a nurse tank. So if we're out in the field and we need extra water, we don't have to go to town. We don't have to go to the next door neighbor. You can just suck off that thing and put it into your tank on your ATV or your UTV.